Yuval Harari, welcome. Uh, you published uh, your novel, Sapiens, six years ago. It was a huge bestseller. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel the need to reshape it into a graphic novel? The idea is to reach new audiences, people who might not read an ordinary science book, but who might be connected to a graphic novel, to, the, uh, to, to this form. I think it's very important to bring science to as many people as possible. We see it with the COVID pandemic. What happens when the, some people in the general public uh, don't understand the latest scientific theories? So the idea was to experiment with different ways of explaining science, of telling history. So one part of the graphic novel is like a detective movie, and one part is like a, a, a superhero action movie, and one part is like reality TV show. It was really the most fun project I ever worked on, just coming up with all these new ways of telling history yeah. and of conveying scientific knowledge. Yes, it's also fun to read it, actually, to look at the pictures. It's very well done. Why, for you, is it so important to reach out to these new, maybe also younger readers? Well, as I said, I mean, we see around us the importance of reaching the general public with the latest findings of science so that they don't fall prey to all kinds of ridiculous conspiracy theories. And uh, more and more in the 21st century, most of the major political issues will demand a good understanding of science, whether it's climate change, whether it's the rise of artificial intelligence, whether it's the spread of bioengineering. People, not everybody can have a PhD in uh, uh, climate science or in ecology or in history, but everybody can grasp the basics of the latest scientific theories if you explain them in the right way. Yeah. Scientists often suffer from two big problems. First of all, that scientific reality is just complicated you know, just understanding what a virus is and how it spreads, it's very complicated. It's much easier to believe some conspiracy theory. And secondly, what makes it worse, that scientists often don't know how to convey their ideas and theories. They talk in numbers and statistics and models and so forth, which is good if you have a conversation within the university, but you lose most people. Most people think in stories, so you need to find ways to translate the latest scientific discoveries into interesting stories. Yeah. Now, last week, Nick Clegg from Facebook was on our show to talk about the threats that big tech pose on democracy. Do you share the, the fear? Do you see these dangers also from, from platforms like Facebook, like Google, that in, in a sense that there is no longer a common truth? Well, I don't... I think the, the threat is, is much bigger than that. In terms of truth, there was always a problem. Um, whenever people communicate in, in any means, they can communicate the truth or they can communicate all kinds of falsehoods. We saw it 500 years ago with the rise of print that the biggest bestsellers of the early modern period, they were not Copernicus and Galileo Galilei and things like that. There were books like the famous Hammer of the Witches one of the first bestsellers of the print era, which was a do-it-yourself guide to identifying and killing witches. Um, so I don't think there is anything new here. What is alarming is that the new technologies for the first time in human history makes it possible to follow everybody all the time and to gather so much data on every person that you can actually hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers, hacking smartphones, bank accounts, but the really big story of our time is the emerging ability to hack human beings. To hack a human being means that you have so much data on that person and so much computing power that you can know that person better than they know themselves. And then you can predict their behavior and manipulate them. You know, dictators throughout history dreamt about having such a power, but they didn't have the technology. Stalin couldn't follow every Soviet citizen 24 hours a day and know what he or she is thinking and feeling. But the 21st century Stalin will be able to do it, and we already have a number of candidates for the job of 21st century Stalin. Yeah. 
So we have to be very careful about this technology. Yes, I understand what you say. You repeatedly said um, that COVID might not be the biggest challenge of our time, but in hindsight, it might be the moment we took the wrong turn in the data revolution. This is what you mean. Yes, I mean, COVID makes it, it accelerates the process of digitalization and automatization. It legitimizes the deployment of mass surveillance, even in democratic countries, and it makes surveillance go under your skin. You know, previously, it was corporations, governments, uh, knowing where you go, what you buy, who you meet, now with COVID, we are seeing surveillance beginning to go under the skin into the body. They want to know what your body temperature, what your blood pressure. Now, this is just a, a small step. But within 10, 20 years, it could be feasible that, you know, every person wears a biometric bracelet that constantly monitors what's happening inside your body. This can easily stop all epidemics. It can create the best and cheapest healthcare system in history, and it can also be the basis for the worst totalitarian regime that ever existed. Now, I'm not against surveillance technology. I think we need to use it just to do it wisely. That, for example, the new tools should not be given to the police or the army or uh, the government, but to an independent healthcare authority which will not misuse it. And also, whenever you increase surveillance of the individuals, you must balance it by simultaneously increasing surveillance of the government and big corporations. Yeah. You know, there are now trillions of dollars being spent and distributed. And um, we need much closer surveillance of who gets the money. Now let's, let's have a look at this says, under the, well, under we the skin. If we have this in the middle of the pandemic, then, you know, if it's not dif too difficult to monitor me, it shouldn't be too difficult to monitor very carefully who gets what and why. Yeah. Let's have a look closely at this under the skin surveillance because, of course, you, you say we should use it wisely. There are dangers attached to it. But let's have a look at the advantages. You say... This under-the-skin surveillance, new data, new technology, AI, artificial intelligence, it can cure us. Yeah, it can create the best care healthcare system in history. I mean, if you talk about epidemics, so again, just imagine the situation when everybody goes around all the time with some biometric bracelet or other device that constantly monitors what's happening inside your body. So the moment your body temperature starts rising or there are other signs that something is wrong, the uh, health authority knows that you're sick and you're isolated and that's it. That's the end of the epidemic. If we had such a system today, there won't be COVID. And that's the danger. I mean, it's so tempting because it is. And again, it's not just fighting COVID. If you have such a system, you can stop all the flu epidemics, which also kill lots of people every year. If you have such a system, you can detect whenever somebody begins to have cancer, not when it's too late and the cancer spreads everywhere in the body. You can detect cancer when it's just beginning, just a few yeah. cells, and it's very easy and cheap to cure it. All right. So the advantages are enormous. I don't want to deny them. First of all, because we don't want to miss them, and also because this is the, the danger, that it's so tempting. But we need to remember that, you know, our emotions are a biological phenomenon just like our diseases. The same system that can know if I just got COVID or I have the flu can also know if I'm angry or if I'm bored or if I'm happy. So, you know, people are now watching this show so with old-style old surveillance, somebody knows that you are now watching this show. But they don't know how you feel about what I say. With biometric surveillance, they can know that you are angry about what you hear. Or you, th you think it's ridiculous. Nah, it will never happen. This is science fiction. Or you're just bored. Let, let, let's find out what's on Netflix. They can know that. Now, you know, corporations want to know it, Netflix wants to know it, 
but also big governments want, want to know it. Again, imagine the 21st century Stalin. So he or she, probably a he, gives the speech that everybody needs to hear, everybody yes. needs to listen. So we're, now, we're, we're so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Mr. Uh, Harari, but we're nearly, uh, so I would like to have a short answer if you can. These are the dangers. The, <laughs> these are the dangers that that you describe of AI and this new technology that can f that can watch us so closely under the skin. How can we use it wisely? How can we prevent people from misusing it? Governments from misusing it? How do we do that in the future? So don't concentrate too much power in just one place. It's of course very efficient to concentrate all the power in one place, but that's the high road to a digital dictatorship. Keep it separate, it's less efficient, but this, this is a feature, not a bug. Secondly, again, whenever you increase surveillance of the individuals, at the same time, you increase surveillance at, of the governments and corporations, so it's easier for us to know what they are doing with our data, with our money, and, and so forth. And the principle should be, yes, data is wonderful if it's used for the benefit of the person whose data it is. You know, my doctor today already have immense data about me, and that's fine because my doctor is using it to protect me. If my doctor starts selling it to third party to make money, that's bad. So it's the same with future data systems. The principle is we collect data on people in order to help these people. That's it. No third parties and no hidden agendas. Yes, let's, let's hope that it will be that way. You dedicate your graphic novel, Sapiens, to the species who are no longer here. The extinct, the disappeared, the forgotten. All that comes together, you write, eventually will scatter. It sounds a little scary, yet comforting. Even the new generation AI, human, Sapiens, Homo sapiens we discussed right now will eventually turn to dust. Uh, yes, they will turn to all kinds of things and eventually they will also turn to dust. Is that, is that, is that scary or is that comforting? Mm, that's just a reality. <laughs> I think we need to come to terms with it. I mean, so many of the terrible things in history are actually the result not of people being evil, but of people refusing to accept reality as it is. Thanks very much for this interview, Yuval Noah Harari. Thank, Thank you. you very much.